Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we welcome everyone to our ongoing study of Srimad Bhagavatam for the Bhakti Vaibhav standard. And we're studying Canto 6, and we're on tonight. We want to begin chapter number 8. And we also want to go on to chapter 9, according to the schedule which has been set up for the course, supposed to cover two chapters in the class today. So this eighth chapter, of course, is not a lot of uh, content, still content is there. But anyway, they want us to go through it quite quickly because we have to cover quite a few chapters in the course of this uh, unit. It's chapter 7, 8, 9, then next week 10 and 11 and then 12 and then 13 is the next unit. All right, so tonight we're looking the Narayana Kavacha. So we heard yesterday, we heard about Vish, how the demigods had taken Vishwarupa for their guru. Vishwarupa had agreed that he would be the guru for the demigods, although he was a younger man than the demigods. And, but still he agreed and uh, he began to give them worship on behalf of the, perform sacrifice on behalf of the demigods. And he also gave them the mantra, he gave them this mantra, this Narayana Kavacha. He gave them this mantra, he told them this mantra will protect, would protect Indra, would protect the demigods against the military power of the demons. So this Narayana Kavacha is Vishnu Mantra, of course, from the name Narayan. So Vishnu Mantra and begins like that. The first part of the mantra is putting the shield, making the mantra like a, a shield, a Kavacha, a shield. And they, you put it on the, around the body, around the different limbs of the body. They have to chant, first of all, well, they do Akshman and the whole, we're given, we're given a full description of how to do the mantra, how to put the armor on. I remember at one point, devotees were chanting this Narayana Kavacha. There was uh, some crisis in our Juhu temple. It was a, they just recently opened, but there was a very serious problem in the Juhu temple and some devotees were in a lot of trouble. So they were chanting the Narayana Kavacha every day and it helped them, it definitely protected them because the devotees survived the crisis. Anyway, they chant first of all Om Namo Narayanaya which is the eight-syllable mantra, and then you're supposed to chant the twelve-syllable mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And then uh, chant this Om Vishnave Namaha, six-syllable mantra. <laughs> like this, different mantras all to be chanted, and you have to chant them. So each syllable you put on a different part, a different part of the body, and then you chant it in the reverse order also. And so quite elaborate description is given. And then also after you chant, then there's the meditation on all the different forms of the Lord and how the, the different forms of the Lord can protect us. Sorry, just a minute. <laughs> Thank you. 
the, the, you have to recite this uh, Nishringa Kavacha prayer, which is given here in this chapter, and how you pray to the different forms of the Lord to protect you in different situations. So Sukadeva Goswami asked Maharaj Parikshit to explain, uh, rather Maharaj Parikshit asked Sukadeva Goswami that he wanted Sukadeva to explain to him about the Narayana Kavacha because he knew that it had helped Indra to achieve success in the battle. So he wanted to hear about it. And Sukadeva Goswami recites the whole thing. And he knows, he knows the whole thing and he can recite it all. And he tells how to do it, how to chant. So some points come up in the course of the purport, just to bring you to, to, to your attention. I won't go through it all verse by verse because it will take too long. But it's mentioned, uh, text, uh, text 11 says, After finishing this chanting, one should think himself qualitatively one with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is full in six opulences and is worthy to be meditated upon. Then one should chant the following protective prayer to Lord Narayana, the Narayana Kavacha. So Prabhupada's purport, which is in text number 12, he talks about thinking oneself one with the Supreme Lord is called Ahangarhopasana. So this Ahangarhopasana is mentioned here. We've come across this word before in the, uh, I think it's in the second canto, the beginning of the second canto, first steps in God realization, then also this concept is introduced that one one does not become God but he thinks of himself as qualitatively one with the Supreme. So qualitatively one with the Supreme. Of course this is the meditation of the devotee that we understand we are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord. From the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Mammi Vamsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Buddha Sanatana, that the living entities are eternally my parts and parcels. So we're part of the parcel of the Supreme Lord. We're not the whole parcel, but we're part of the parcel. So this is a hunger hopasana, to think of herself as qualitatively one with the Supreme equal in quality to the Supreme Spirit. And the way the water of a the way the, the water of a river is of the same nature as the water of the sea. We should meditate upon the Supreme Lord. It's described in this verse. So you can see it, it's a it's a, it's a long meditation and it's very powerful, very good practice for devotees to do this kind of meditation, meditate on the different forms of the Lord, and we're told about different avatars. For example, you can see here, text 13, May Lord Vamana protect me on the land. And then, uh, May Vishwarup protect me in the sky, Vishwarup being the the universal form. And then may Lord Nisringade protect me in all directions. Like this, meditating on the Lord in his different forms, how, he, how the devotee wants to be protected. May the Lord be kind enough to protect me in difficult places like the forest and the battlefront. And then, May Lord Bohr, Lord Bohr protect me from the rogues on the street. And may Lord Parasaram protect me on the tops of mountains. And may Lord Ramachandra, 
protect me in foreign countries. Like this, a devotee who is in a lot of danger, then they will pray like this. So as I said, like that, sometimes devotees, where we can be also in a dangerous situation. So we can take shelter of the Lord through this kind of prayer. So it goes on and we hear about many different devotees and forms of the Lord. Sanat Kumar is mentioned, that's a, an important one for the brahmacharis practicing celibacy. <clears throat> May Sanat Kumar protect me from lusty desires. So Prabhupada writes in the purport, lusty desires are very strong in everyone and they are the greatest impediment to the discharge of devotional service. Right? The greatest impediment to the discharge of devotional service. That's one of the questions there, which is asked, uh, what is the greatest impediment? So lusty desires are the greatest impediment. And uh, the, those who are very much influenced by lusty desires are advised to take shelter of Sanat Kumar, the great Brahmachari devotee. So, like that helps, it can give help for somebody who's practicing Brahmachari life. And worshipping Narada Muni, be Narada Muni protect me from committing offences and worshipping the deity. Maybe you're a pujari, you're doing deity worship, we want to be cautious about offences. It can be very dangerous. So taking shelter of Narada Muni, because Narada Muni, he's an acharya in deity worship. He wrote his book about worshipping the deities. He's given us a lot of instructions about deity worship. And Lord Kurma, the tortoise, protect me from falling to the unlimited hellish planets. Like this, a devotee prays, offering prayers to the Lord, that we can be protected from all these dangerous situations. And then we come across the, this is text number 19, talks about Lord Buddha. Of course, Lord Buddha is also one of our avatars, and that's the avatars, Lord Buddha is also mentioned. There are many Buddhas. You know, if you ever try to preach in a Buddhist country, it's, it's not, that they, will never go, they will never accept that Buddha is an avatar of Vishnu. They have their own concepts, and there are many Buddhas. There's not just one Buddha, there's many different Buddhas. But anyway, the, the Buddha, who is a Vishnu avatar, we're praying to him here, as, and we pray, may he protect me from activities opposed to Vedic principles and from laziness that causes one to madly forget the Vedic principles of knowledge and ritualistic action. So it's a very interesting uh, point here. Uh, to understand the mission of Lord Buddha, that his purpose, of course, was to save the people, to save the animals, to, to stop the animal killing. Because the people were follow, they were follow, they were doing Vedic rituals. And, and in the Vedas, it talks about sacrificing animals. So with the appearance of Lord Buddha, Lord Buddha preached against the sacrificing of animals. But then the people said, well, it's in the Vedas. So then Lord Buddha said, then we will forget the Vedas, give up the Vedas. So Lord Buddha led people away from the Vedas because they were not understanding the Vedas properly. The Brahmanas had become corrupt and degraded. And with the degradation of the Brahminical culture, they had taken up all of this animal sacrifice. And it was so common, everywhere there was killing of animals. So Lord Buddha came and he stopped it all. He stopped all of these rituals. And he, he led the people away from the Vedas. Of course, later on, Shankaracharya came and he brought back the Vedas. And he also established good Brahminical culture. 
Of course, at the same time, he introduced the Mayavadi philosophy. But after Shankaracharya, then the Vaishnava Acharyas came. So anyway, we want to understand the mission of Lord Buddha, that uh, he wants to stop people from mis misusing the injunctions of the Vedas. People were sent in the name of the Vedas, they were killing animals. And so Lord Buddha had to lead the people away from the Vedas. All right, so then there are many different examples given different people praying to be protected from you can go through them for yourself we won't go through each and every one just picking out some examples This uh, text is important here also, this, this text, uh, this is 32 and 33, where it talks about the Lord and it's described He says, those who are advanced in spiritual knowledge see unity and diversity. For such advanced persons, the Lord's bodily decorations, his name, his fame, his attributes and forms, and the weapons in his hand are manifestations of the strength of his potency. According to their elevated spiritual understanding, the omniscient Lord who manifests various forms is present everywhere. May he always protect us everywhere from all calamities. All right, so in the purport, Srila Prabhupada explains here about the, the ornaments on the body of the Lord. And it's mentioned here that uh, the prayer to the ornaments and carriers of the Lord is not false, for they are as good as the Lord. Since the Lord is all-pervasive, he exists in everything, and everything exists in him. Therefore, even worship of the Lord's weapons or ornaments has the same potency as worship of the Lord. So, uh, we're asked actually what, why we can, how we can worship the ornaments of the Lord. But it's pointed out that the ornaments of the Lord are not different from the Lord. And Later on in that same paragraph, Prabhupada writes, The Lord is always present everywhere by his name, form, qualities, attributes and paraphernalia. And they all have equal power to protect the devotees. So on this basis, you can worship also the ornaments of the Lord. His form, his qualities, his abode are all eternal. We say Aradhanam, Aradhanam Vishnur, Aradhanam Param Tat, Tasmat Parataram Devi, Tadiyanam Samacharam. That the worship of Lord Vishnu is the highest, but even greater than the worship of Vishnu is the worship of those things in relationship to Vishnu. So, the same principle applies here, that worship of the Lord's weapons or the ornaments of the weapons 
can even be greater than the worship of the Lord, or at least the same as the Lord. Of course, the Mayavadis, they have a problem trying to understand this. This is uh, their problem. They are not accustomed to these kind of things. But in Krishna consciousness, we can see these things, this principle applies. And it, there's also a section about Advaya Gyan. What is, oh yeah, you can see there, text number 30, they talk about Advaya Gyan. That's something also which we should know about, which we should be familiar with. It's mentioned there in the purport of text number 30. It says, therefore, the Lord is called Advaya Gyan, indicating that there is no difference between him and his name, form, qualities, weapons, and so on. Anything pertaining to him is in the same category of spiritual existence. They are all engaged in the service of the Lord in varieties of spiritual forms. Right? So that's an important point. We have to know these kind of things. We should know these kind of terms. All right, so the, the mantra is finished and then Vishwarupa is explaining the kind of benefits you get from it. Text number 35. This mystic armor related to Lord Narayan has been described by me to you. By putting on this protective covering, you will certainly be able to conquer the leaders of the demons. If one employs this armour, whomever he sees with his eyes or touches with his feet is immediately freed from all the above-mentioned dangers. So this is the power of the Narayana Kavacha. And then the next verse talks about you, this prayer is never disturbed or put in danger by the government, by plunderers, by evil demons, or by any type of disease. If you use this prayer, you'll never be disturbed by any of these problems. So people with disease can also chant this. And we're given an example. The King of Heaven, oh, well, uh, Vishwarup is talking to Indra, so he's telling him about one Brahmana named Koshika. Koshika used this armor when he gave up his body in the desert by mystic power. And then it happened that later on, the Chitrarata, the king of Gandharva Loka, was in his airplane, but the airplane fell from the spot. And he, and he, got, he was ordered by great sages called the Valik Valikilyas, the Valikilyas, to throw the Brahmana's bones into the nearby river Saraswati. He had to do this and bathe in the river before returning to his own abode. So this was the power. The Brahmana Koshika got that benefit by chanting the mantra. So, King Indra had received this mantra from Vishwarup, and in this way, you can see text 42 describes, King Indra, who performed 100 sacrifices, received this prayer of protection from Vishwarup. After conquering the demons, he enjoyed all the opulences of the three worlds. So this is the power of chanting the mantra. 
And in the purport, there's an interesting statement. It says that Madhvacharya says, a, a, a quotation from Madhvacharya, one must receive all kinds of mantras from a bona fide spiritual master. Otherwise, the mantras will not be fruitful. So, the, the, of course, the Madhvas, they're very much into chanting mantras. They know a lot of mantras. And if you go to see any of these uh, Sanskrit colleges which the Madhvas have, you see the people there, they study so much. And Madhva, of course, was very powerful in defeating Mayavada philosophy. And the people who go to the Madhva College for Sanskrit, they all learn all the arguments which Madhvacharya has to defeat Mayavadi philosophy. So Madhvacharya says here, you have to know all kinds of mantras and you have to receive them from the bona fide spiritual master. And so, of course, we know sampradaya vihina ye mantraste nishvala mata. That if we get the mantra which is not through the parampara, through the sampradaya, then it will not bear any fruit. So it's important that the mantras have to come through the authorized channel through the line of the disciplic succession. And therefore Prabhupada quotes is 434 from the Bhagavad Gita, the importance of hearing from the bona fide spiritual master. All right, so I've covered the main points of chapter 8. Are there any questions anybody has on this chapter? Before we go on to chapter Maharaj, 9. Uh, may I ask one question? Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj Dandar Pranam. That uh, the Buddha in our history is different from the Buddha described in the Veda. Is it uh, different or the same? The Buddha where? The Buddha described in our history uh, is different from the Veda described in Veda, in Vedic literature. Well, the Vedic literature, you only, there's really only the one Buddha, I mean, the, the Buddha who is talked about in the Das Avatar Stotra by Jayadev Goswami, who put the one Buddha in there in the Das Avatar Stotra. So that's generally who we think of as being Buddha, the one who came to stop the killing of the animals. But there's, there's, there are other Buddhas. And even in Srimad Bhagavatam, they will talk sometimes about another Buddha from a different time. And certainly in Buddhism, they have a lot of different Buddhas. Because the whole goal of the Buddhist, their Buddhist thing is to become a Buddha. And for them, their idea is to become Buddha, it's not to become God. And they don't say Buddha's God, they don't say Buddha's man. He's Buddha, and their goal is to become a Buddha, and everybody's a Buddha. And, and the, if they get the goal of their Buddha's meditation, they become Buddha. They meditate on becoming Buddha. But in our Vedas, of course, they just pre we don't give a lot of philosophy, we don't give much about Lord Buddha. A little bit, just mainly you speak about killing the animals, that he stopped the killing of the animals. He promoted ahimsa. But if you go to uh, countries like Thailand, all the Buddhist monks, they're all meat eaters. They all eat meat. They, uh, they say, well, I didn't kill anything. They just go, they go begging every day and people give them meat. And so they say, I didn't kill anything. So there's two schools of Buddhism. So one school of Buddhism, they, they're vegetarian. The other school, the, the old school, they're all meat eaters. They'll eat whatever people give them.
So, you know, the principle of Buddha, as we know it from the Vedas, is he taught ahimsa, non-violence. But they interpret this ahimsa, they say, it just means eating. And if you don't eat meat, then you're considered you're not a Buddha, you're not a Buddhist. There was one Buddhist master, he started a group and he told all his people to be vegetarian. So the other Buddhists, they took him to court and they made a court case against him. And they said, if you don't eat meat, then you're not a Buddhist. So he said, okay, then we'll be Brahmins. We call ourselves Brahmins. Anyway, these kind of things are going on, Kali Yuga. Buddhism was an emergency philosophy. It wasn't meant to be a sanatan dharma. It was an emergency to lead the people away from the Brahminical culture and to stop all the killing of the animals. Okay. Yes, somebody yes, else. There's another hand up there. Thank you, Maharaj and Dr. Pranam Maharaj. Actually, yes, in, uh, uh, we just learned from Sri Prabhupada's purport that uh, one who uh, prays Lord Buddha helps others misusing Vedic injunctions. But uh, during the incarnation of Lord Buddha, Vedic injunctions were contravened, were violated. So no one uh, obeyed the Vedic rules. So if one prays Lord Buddha, assuming that he is the Supreme Person to Godhead, how this purport has relevance in understanding this conception? Well, Lord Buddha saw that the people could not accept the principle. Lord Buddha was trying to tell them what the Vedas say, but they could not accept it. So he said, okay, just follow me. So they had faith in him and they followed him. So Lord Buddha is actually Shakti, you know, Shaktivesha avatar. He's the, the Lord himself. He's empowered to deliver the Lord, to de deliver the message of the Lord. So they followed him and they got delivered because they had faith in him. They didn't follow the Vedas. They didn't follow any injunctions of the Vedas. They didn't have faith in these things, but they had faith in the Buddha and they followed him. And because they followed him, they were able to be delivered. Oh, yes, uh, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, yeah, I have another question. Uh, so we have studied in uh, Bhagavad Gita, Badanti tat vidas tatam yat jnanam adhoyam brahmati paramatmati bhagavanati sabdhate. That, uh, that adhoya, word is uh, used there. So that means uh, Lord is realizing three different features in three different realizations, Brahman, uh, Paramatma and Bhagavan. So um, Maharaj, so if this non-dual understanding is that Lord and Lord's paraphernalia are non-different, so because these are the three different uh, realizations and uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is full of uh, simultaneous oneness and difference, has a very significant role in explaining all uh, diversities uh, in the Vedic wisdom. So how this can be correlated uh, in so far as understanding of this word is concerned, so? Yes. Well, we understand everything, the Lord and his paraphernalia all being one. Not that they're Brahman. We don't say that the, the Lord's weapons and like that are Brahman, but they're because they're connected with the Lord. It's his paraphernalia. And so they're, they're not material, they're spiritual. Just like the Lord's abode, the Holy Dham, Vrindavan, or Mathura, Dwarka, they're, holy, they're not different from the Lord. The Lord appears there. These, and so these things are, they're, they're not different from him. This is his, his spiritual potency, that all of these things, they're in relation to the Lord. I quoted that verse, 
Aradhanam Sarvisham Vishnur Aradhanam Param Tasmat Parataram Devi Tadiyanam Samacharam Of all kinds of worship, the worship of Lord Vishnu is the highest. But even greater than the worship of Lord Vishnu is the worship of those things in relationship to Vishnu. And we, of course, we do. We worship Tulsi. We worship Prabhupada. We worship our founder Acharya because they are in relationship to the Lord. So it's even, it's, it, it's even greater than the worship of the Lord. And so the example is given here in this section that the Lord's ornaments, worship of the Lord's ornaments because the demigods are offering prayers to the ornaments of the Lord and they're not different from the Lord. Everything in the spiritual world has consciousness. So the Lord's ornaments are also conscious. They're not, they're not material. You have to understand these things. That they're one with the Lord and at the same time different from the Lord. One in the sense that they're spiritual energy. And different. In the sense, they're the ornaments, they're not the Lord, they're his ornaments. But they're decorating the body of the Lord. It's quite nothing to do with Brahman. It's the spiritual energy of the Lord. His internal potency. Of course, we have difficulty to appreciate these things. We just simply have to hear. We have to hear these things carefully. You have to hear, and you have to hear again and again. And when we hear for the first time, of course, it's a shock. Just like there, there, was, there, there was this one lady disciple of Srila Prabhupada. She's a very famous lady, actually. Uh, anyway, she said to Prabhupada, she asked Prabhupada, what does it mean, Prabhupada? The moon was churned from the ocean of milk. And Prabhupada said, say it again. So she said, the moon was churned from the ocean of milk. Prabhupada said, say it again. The moon was churned from the ocean of milk. And so Prabhupada said to her, now do you understand? And she said, yes, Prabhupada. The moon was churned from the ocean of milk. So the same way, hearing about the Lord and his ornaments, you have to understand these things as Prabhupada relates them to us here. The demigods are offering prayers to the ornaments of the Lord because they're the Lord's paraphernalia. They're directly resting on the body of the Lord. They're not ordinary, not material, but they have great spiritual potency. And by worshipping them, then you get a lot of mercy. So we want to appreciate these, just like Prabhupada taught us, don't put the madangas on the floor. Prabhupada was very, don't put the madangas, don't put the car towels on the floor. Don't let the paraphernalia of the Lord sit on the floor. Why not? It's the Lord's paraphernalia. It's spiritual. Okay. Uh, yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much for so much uh, explanatory and elaborate uh, uh, explanation. Maharaj, yeah, another question uh, that is taking my mind. Madhacharya was... Uh, a spiritual ambassador in the disciple succession from Brahma Madhya Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, I don't know. But from Madhacharya, the lineage, that means the disciple succession that flew from Madhacharya, uh, yeah, they adopted uh, Prathama Sriti conception, means they started worshipping Param Guru conception, etc., what I was studying from a literature given by one of the devotees of Iskand. 
How can you explain it uh, for clear understanding? Who who started worshipping Param Guru? In Madhacharya Sampradaya. The Sampradaya that started from Madhacharya, mm -hmm. they believed in Prathama Sritik theory, means that disciple succession, unlike ours, did not uh, continue. Well, the disciple succession did not continue. Yeah, from Madhacharya uh, towards uh, his descendants in that way, in the disciple succession that uh, few from Madhacharya uh, onwards, that was uh, uh, adulterated with uh, that uh, Prathama Sritik theory. Is it? Well, I'm not an expert in what's going on in the Madhvatsampradaya. Of course, we know from the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went there to Udupi and he saw within the line of Madhvacharya, he saw how at the time when he went there that they had become engaged in ritualistic activities, were given a lot of importance to rituals and uh, fruit of activities and the d desire for liberation was also there. So he saw that they were not focusing on pure devotional service. But Madhvacharya himself, he focused on pure devotional service. So there was a, you know, a decline in the, in the standards. Even you go there today, if you go, yeah, just not long ago I was there in Bangalore and we went to a Madhvacharya temple and I saw them do a lot of rituals, so many rituals were going on. Karma candy kind of rituals. So, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Rupa Goswami, we're following Rupa Goswami, Anyabila Sita Sunyam Jnana Karma Janavritam. This is our principle in devotional service. We emphasize pure devotion. But from the time of Madhvacharya, it was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took the initiation in the line of Madhvacharya because of Madhavendra Puri, that Madhavendra Puri had brought the seed of love of God in the form of ecstatic love for the Lord. And that is why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted initiation in that line of Madhvacharya, because of Madhavendra Puri. It was Madhavendra Puri who had actually brought the real mode of love of God into that sampradaya. Taught people about, or he had emphasized that feeling the separation from the Lord, that mood of Vipralamba Seva. This was there and you can see Madhavendra Puri when he departed from the world, how he was chanting the prayer in the mood of Srimati Radharani, as she was feeling the separation from Lord Krishna. So Madhavendra Puri was a very great Acharya and because of his presence Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took the initiation in that line from Ishvara Puri. That's what I know. Okay, there's one more hand up here, Prabhu. Yes, what's your question? Asim Krishna, is it? Yes, uh, Maharaj. No, no, no. Uh, Maharaj, just continuing from the same question asked by Govinda Prabhu, it just clicked on my mind. Uh, so, is it right to call our Sampradaya Dham, Madhav, Gaudi, a Western Sampradaya? Because in Vrindavan, we go to the Radha Shams in the temple and it's written in bold letters that our Sampradaya, Matha Sampradaya, Gaudi Sampradaya, different Sampradaya. So, how to answer them? In a sense. What what do they say? Which sampradaya? They say that uh, Madhva Sampradaya and Gaudiya Sampradaya are different sampradaya. Uh -huh. And we uh, Well uh, Well we point we do we do present the line of the cyclic succession, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did, did accept initiation in that line coming from Madhva Acharya. 
But then later on, after taking initiation in the line from Madhvacharya, then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you know, he has his own branch, he's like a branch of the Madhva Sampradaya, you know. Of course, we're not strict followers of the Madhva Sampradaya. They give a lot of importance to, uh, to Shastras, which we don't... We, we, which we don't give so much importance to. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu emphasized Srimad Bhagavatam. They don't put so much emphasis on the Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Another small thing, Maharaj, you just mentioned that uh, the Buddhists eat meat and they give some logic for that. What was that uh, logic? I didn't catch it that was Buddha himself stress, uh, stopped the violence towards animals. Uh, well, simply they say they didn't kill the animal. They didn't. They say simply we didn't kill the animal. They go begging every day, and and whatever food is given to them, then they eat. And people, of course, they go to the market. They'll stand in the market there, and people will come and give them meat. And they take it back and eat it. When you go to the temples today, you see Buddhist temples. So many dogs are there. Because whatever they don't eat, they give to the dogs. So the dogs have a feast on all the meat. And of course, the Buddhists say eat the meat. I was I one time I was distributing literature in Thailand, and I had no place to stay, so I went to the Buddhist temple rather than going to a hotel. I went to the Buddhist temple, and they let me stay the night. And in the morning, they asked me. They said, "You would would you like something to eat?" I said, "Well, I'm a vegetarian." So they said to me, they said, then they, we have nothing. They said, everything we have is meat, fish and eggs. I said, then it's okay. I said, I don't need anything. Thank you. But that's how they are. This is a, there's two schools of Buddhism. There's the Mahayana and the Theravada. The Theravada is the old tradition and the old tradition, they're like that. They will eat everything. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, what would be their destination? Well, I heard, I heard uh, from someone else, I, I did, but I heard that Rabindra Swarup Prabhu said, <laughs> I didn't hear from him directly, I should ask him about that, but he, I heard that he said, the Buddhists would go to the river between the material and spiritual world and take a bath there and then come back in the material world. They wouldn't enter into the spiritual world. But some people, we do claim, there's, sometimes they claim that there's a, a, there's a planet of Lord Buddha in the Vaikuntha sky because, you know, one Buddha is an avatar of Vishnu, so he has his abode in the spiritual sky. So people who are actually followers of Buddha in the mood of servant, then they could maybe go there. But generally, Buddhas, they don't have that mood of servant, but their mood is to become the Buddha. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Yes, one more hand is up, Prabhu. Yes? Is it? Prabhu, uh, as you said that one Mataji asked about uh, moon, uh, John from the was person. What is that actually? I don't know. Uh, follow that. Uh, moon is a planet and uh, Mercury is a planet. Well, it's, it's just a sentence which is coming from Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah. It's a sentence there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So she read it and she was puzzled by it. So Prabhupada said, just read it and read it again, and then, okay, that's what it means. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is actually the, what is the meaning actually? Actually, was it there in the milk of ocean or what? Well, when the demigods and the demons were churning the ocean of milk, at some point the moon came out from the ocean of milk. Uh, prior to that, moon was also there? Well... I don't know about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Nice. Alright. So, we'll, let's have a look at chapter 9. We're going to hear about the appearance of the demon Vritasura. Oh, what a topic, right? The demon Vritasura is going to come. Of course, he's a great devotee. He's not an ordinary 
demon, but he is really a devotee. All right, so the chapter begins, Sukadeva Goswami continues, he said, Vishwarup was engaged as a priest, and Vishwarup had three heads. <laughs> and we're told about the three heads. You know, how he got three heads, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, but one point which comes up in the purport, Prabhupada talks about the Vedic system, right? I'm bringing these different points up because these are topics which are, which uh, questions are made, which will help us, you know, when you have to do the closed book test, these kind of things will come up, right? What is the Vedic system? And Prabhupada explains, the Vedic knowledge is called Shruti, because it must be received by being heard from authorities. It is beyond the realm of the false experimental knowledge. So here, the, the Vedic system is to hear from the bona fide speaker, from the proper authority. That is called Shruti. So it was heard, Vishwarup had three heads. And as we heard before, Vishwarupa, his mother is from the family of the demons. And the father is a Brahmana. The father was Twasta. Uh, so when he would do the sacrifice, it's mentioned there in text number two, it said he would offer, he would make an offering for the demigods, for Indra, and then he'd offer again for the demons. The different demigods got their share, but the demon, he would also offer for the demons. Of course, he wouldn't let them know. He would do it secretly, without the knowledge of the demigods. Text number three said, without the knowledge of the demigods, he also offered oblations to the demons, because they were his relatives through his mother. So you can see he had some bodily consciousness there, affection for the mother, the family, the mother. <laughs> and so he doesn't want to give all the bless, all the mercy, all the benefit to the demigods. So it happened, of course, he was doing like this. So once upon a time, Indra understood that Vishwarup was secretly chanting, he was secretly cheating the demigods, by offering oblations on behalf of the demons. So Indra, he's also in the bodily consciousness, he became extremely afraid of being defeated by the demons. And in great anger at Vishwarup, he cut Vishwarup's three heads from his shoulders. So. And then we're told how his head's transformed into different birds. And then Indra has to suffer sinful reactions for this. You, do, you kill a Brahmana, but it's very serious to kill a Brahmana. Wow. So, it's, but text number eight said, Indra was so powerful that he could neutralize the sinful reactions for killing a brahmana. But he didn't do it. Instead, he accepted the burden of these reactions with folded hands. Again, we, you see something of the, the power of Indra, that, 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 that although he has some faults, he has some good side also. He understood he had done something sinful and he accepted the reactions with folded hands. And text number eight said, he suffered for one year and then to purify himself, he distributed the reactions for the sinful killing among the earth, water, trees and women. <laughs> And it, it, of course, it's, this is a well-known part of Srimad Bhagavatam, this section, this, how Indra distributed the sinful reactions to these different people. And why is he able to distribute the sinful reactions? 
because he done he'd given favors to them he'd given some blessings to them just like earth what had he done for the earth he'd allowed the earth that usually the in the earth there will be ditches and there will be holes he would allow that the earth could fill fill up and the earth would become level so because he allowed the earth to become level in that way so the earth was indebted to indra so indra gave one fourth of his sinful reactions to the earth and that reaction came in the form of deserts that you have deserts across the globe and it's pointed out there that anybody who's living in a desert that in the past life they must have been they may have killed a brahmana <laughs> that's what it says that this is the result of brahmahatya that you have to go and live in the desert and in the desert you're not supposed to perform yajna of course nowadays we do have a lot of people living in the desert and we have a lot of yajna going on there also right in the middle east desert countries but there's a lot of kirtan a lot of sankirtan going on there so we hope the yajna will benefit the people anyway this this point is made that this way the earth uh took one fourth of the reactions of indra's sin for killing a brahmana and then we're told about the next thing we're told about trees that the trees they had taken a benediction from indra that when they're trimmed when they're cut down that they would grow back that the branches would grow again and so because of that they had to take also one fourth of indra's sinful reactions and he was able to give them one fourth and the, the sinful reaction came on the form of came to trees that the trees would produce sap and they would produce a kind of sap which you, no one is supposed to drink this sap so that was the reaction on trees and then the next thing was that you have women and women had taken the benediction from indra that they could enjoy lusty desires continuously even during pregnancy they could still have lusty desires and they could also engage in sexual activities so long as it did not injure their womb and as a result of that the whim the reaction came on the woman that they manifest the signs of menstruation every month so this was a curse on this was the sinful reaction how it came on women and then finally water water was given the benediction that it could mix with other things just like you get some milk you can put water in it and you won't even know you don't know how much water is in it sometimes of course you buy milk and it's got so much water in it or fruit juice you can put water in it or even vegetables like potatoes you can add water into the potatoes and mash the potatoes like so what the water has that benediction that it can increase the volume of something so the, they had to take also one fourth of the reactions for indra's sin of killing a brahmana and that reaction came on water that there will be bubbles and foam in the water and when you want to collect drinking water you should not take water which has bubbles and foam it's not good for drinking so in this way indra distributed his sinful reactions he had suffered himself for one year and then he distributed it to other people who had some obligation to him 
So, did Indra do wrong? First of all, did Indra do wrong in killing Vishwarup? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you want to come? Is the door open? So what do you say? Did Indra do wrong? Was it wrong for him to kill Vishwaru? I would say obviously because he got reactions. If it would have been right, he would have got no reactions. So there was definitely some wrong in it. Yeah. You agree, everyone? Of course, it was a very impulsive thing which he did. It seems to have been very impulsive that he killed him immediately. He didn't question him, what are you doing? He didn't try to reform him <laughs> and he took it very seriously, immediately he killed him. Yeah. Any other comments about this? Uh, whereas, uh, while uh, Brahma asked Indra to take uh, Vishwarupa as their guru, uh, he said that you should not, you should overcome there is uh, uh, some faults, you should overcome that. You should, uh, you should not give pay heed to that. You know, Brahma warned uh, Indra in that way. But uh, Indra didn't uh, listen to, I uh, didn't act accordingly. Well, Indra, Indra had asked him to offer ab ablations for the demigods in favor of the demigods, right? He hadn't asked him to worship the demons. And usually when people perform a yagya, they will offer oblations to the demigods. They won't offer to the demons. But this Vishwarup had some, because of his partiality, because of his leaning towards him. So he had that affection. What you're saying, what you're saying about worshipping Vishnu? What, what, you were talking about Brahma? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Uh, while uh, they went to for Brahma, because uh, Braspati vanished, Braspati was not uh, um, noticed, that's why they went to Brahma, and Brahma said, you can take Vishwarupa as your guru, but uh, you should overcome his, their, his defects. He, he, he is having some defects, you should overcome, you should not pay to that. Yeah, yeah, right. Brahma told them, you have to be tolerant about yeah. that, that he has some affection for the demons, so you should tolerate it. Brahma had told, he would warned them about this, but he told that there should be some tolerance there. And you would expect some tolerance, but Indra didn't show much, he didn't show any tolerance, immediately cut off the heads. So of course he got reactions, killing the Brahmanas, it's, it's a big thing. So anyway, he, he, suffered, he, he took the responsibility himself, he suffered for one year, I don't know if that's one year of the demigods or one year on this planet. <laughs> Big difference. But anyway, he suffered for one year and then he distributed the reactions among these people who had taken, who had taken blessings from him. I think we'll take a break here. Can we take a break here? We'll have our break. I will go on in ten minutes. Okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yep, we want to continue. We're up to text number 11 in this ninth chapter of the sixth canto. We're hearing how 
Vishwarupa had been killed by Indra, and when the father of Vishwarupa, Twasta, got the news, then he was very angry, and he decides to perform a ritual to arrange for the killing of Indra. <laughs> so like we, what we say, tit for tat, you do it to me, I'll do it to you. You, you, kill my, you kill my son, I'm going to kill you. So Twasta is doing some sacrifice and he was chanting mantra. He wants to get, uh, he wants to create a personality from the fire who would kill Indra. But we're told that somehow Twasta got the mantra wrong. He chanted the mantra, instead of short, he, ch he chanted it long. You know, just, we know different letters, some letters are meant to be chanted long and some letters are short. So he got the pronunciation wrong. And so the mantra came out wrong. And instead of getting someone who was going to uh, change, we're told a change from the, the enemy, Indra, it became Indra who is an enemy. Instead of the enemy of Indra, it became Indra who is an enemy. So consequently, instead of an enemy of Indra's, there emerged the body of Ritasura, of whom Indra was the enemy. So, anyway, if you can work that one out. The point is, anyway, he didn't get somebody who was going to kill Indra, but someone who was an enemy of Indra. So anyway, we're, now we're, text 12 describes how this personality came out from the fire. And he was very fearful. A fearful personality looked like the destroyer of the entire creation at the end of the millennium. And there are several verses describing his features. Um, you've all seen the pictures, the illustrations, artist's illustrations, how he's huge, and the hair and the demon's body and his beard were the color of copper, his eyes were piercing like the sun, and he's holding a trident in his hand, and he's dancing and shouting in a loud voice, and the earth is trembling like an earthquake. And even when he yawns, it's, a, it's like he was going to swallow the whole sky with his mouth, which was as deep as a cave. So this demon was actually the son of Twasta. He's like a brother of Vishwarup. Vishwarup had been killed by Indra, so Twasta had created this very fearful demon. And he was of a gigantic stature, he covered all the planetary systems by dint of austerity. So he was called Vrita, which means one who covers everything. So we often see this name in the Vedas, it's often mentioned about Vrita Sura. So when, the, when he appeared, the demigods under the leadership of Indra, they tried to charge against the demon. They came charging him and striking him with their weapons and their arrows and all their different weapons, the clubs and spears, whatever they used. They tried to use them, but it didn't matter what they, what they did. The, the, the demon was so powerful, he just swallowed them. He just swallowed all their weapons. He took them for a, for a snack. So the demons were, uh, the demigods were completely shocked. What to do? This demon is so powerful. So seeing the strength of this demon, the demigods were weakened. Anyway, 
they got together, text 20 says, they all met together to try to please the super soul, the supreme personality of Godhead Narayan, by worshipping him. And then we begin the prayers which they offer to the Lord. Of course, they want the Lord to help them in their situation. They have the problem, this demon is opposing them. And they want to keep the, their position, they're demigods, they're attached to their position. So now they're seeking the help of the Lord to overcome that. One the question comes up, why do the demigods decide to take shelter of the Lord? What would be the, what's the reason? Why would the demigods do that? Why would they take shelter of the Lord? Yes, Prabhu? Uh, whenever there is danger, the demigods take shelter of the Lord. Why? Because they are the devotees of the Lord. What's that got to, but what's the Lord able to do for them? What's, what's, a, what's, you know, they take shelter of the Lord, but is the Lord able to overcome their danger? Yes. Why? How does he do it? The demons, uh, they don't take shelter of the Lord, but the demigods, they take shelter of the Lord. That's why the Lord favors them. Well, the, the demons don't take shelter of the Lord, they, and they sometimes they are victorious. Yeah, that is due to mode of uh, nature, mode of passion, mode of ignorance. So the modes of nature must be the supreme. That is arrangement of the Lord. No. Huh? That is the arrangement of the Lord. Yeah. If you read the purport of text twenty-one, it describes why they take shelter of the Lord. That. Uh, they explain that the Lord. The Lord is without fear. Fear personified is afraid of the Supreme Lord. Fear personified is afraid of the Lord. So taking shelter of the Lord brings about fearlessness. And therefore the demigods decided to take shelter of the Lord. They, take, they know by taking shelter of the Lord, we have the Lord there. The Lord can overcome any danger, any obstacle which we are confronted by. We have faith in the Lord that He will help us to overcome this obstacle. So we, the, the, the demons just, the demigods just take shelter of the Lord. So that, that, that is the answer. Uh, Trying to take shelter of anybody else, it's like the example is given in the next verse, text 22, it said, if you go to some, anybody else to, protect, to help us in danger, to, it's, like, it's like holding the tail of a dog and trying to cross the ocean. Now a dog can also swim. You can see people, sometimes you see people swimming with their dogs. They hold the tail of the dog, the dog will pull them. So, but the dog cannot swim across the ocean. In the same way, if you take shelter of someone other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then you're wasting your time. They're not going to be able to help you to overcome the obstacles. You, we have to take shelter of the Lord. He's the only one who can overcome the greatest fear. Fear personified is defeated by the Lord. Alright, and then 
the demigods continue to offer prayers to the Lord. If you look at text 25, text 25, the personality of Godhead was who created us by the external potency and by whose mercy we expand the creation of the universe is always situated before us as a super soul, but we cannot see his form. We are unable to see him because all of us think that we are separate and independent gods, right? This is an important point. Why we cannot see God? Why we cannot see the Lord? Because we are so infatuated by our own self. We are thinking, I myself am God. I am an independent God. I am separate. Right? That, of course, that's the, the demonic nature. Bhagavad Gita, Ishwaraham. We're thinking, I am the controller. Ishwaraham, Maham Bhogi, Siddhaham, Balabham Sukhi. The demon, the demonic mentality. We have that problem. We're thinking we are the God. We're, the, we're, we're great. Prabhupada writes in the purport, however insignificant we are, we think that we are also God that we can create a universe or that we can create another God. That is why we cannot see or understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, it's an important point to note. So the, there's a lot of uh, long purports and the demigods are offering their prayers to Lord Narayan, to the Super Soul. Here in the next, the next text, uh, this is text 26 and 27, talking about Prakriti and Purush. Prakriti, the material nature, and Purush, the enjoyer. So, it, in the purport it writes, uh, in the commentary, the Bhavarta Deepika replies to the idea that Prakriti and Purush are the causes of the cosmic manifestation. Right? Materialistic people and Mayavadis also, they will say everything comes about because of material nature, from the Prakriti and the Purusha. This is what materialistic people think. Everything comes, life comes from matter. Prakriti. So this is answered here, the Prakriti and Purush. How do, how do you defeat that kind of argument? What, what is the actual cause of the material creation? So in the purport, Prabhupada writes, although Prakriti and Purush superficially appear to be the causes of the material manifestation. Both are emanations of different energies of the Supreme Lord. The Prakriti is the energy of the Lord and the Purusha, the living entities, they are also the energy of the Lord. So nothing is independent of the Lord. And then at the end of the purport, to generate the universe, the Lord acts indirectly. The Lord acts indirectly as a Purusha and directly as a Prakriti. Because both energies emanate from Him, Lord Vasudev, the all-pervasive Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is known as both Prakriti and Purusha. Therefore, Vasudev is the cause of everything. Sarva Karanam Karam. Sarva Karana Karanam. Right? Ishvara Paramakrishna Satchidananda Vigraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. The cause of all causes. Lord Brahma says, 
Lord Krishna is the cause of all causes. So, in this way we respond to this argument that everything is coming from Prakriti, Purusha. So then Sukadeva Goswami describes, so the demigods were offering their prayers to the Lord. At that time Lord Hari, carrying his weapons, the conch shell, disc and club, appears first within their hearts and then before them. So the Lord actually appears before them. And then text 30 says, Surrounding and serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan were 16 personal attendants decorated with ornaments and appearing exactly like him. But, within the, but without the mark of Srivatsa and the, Kastu, the Kastuba jewel. O King, when all the demigods saw the Supreme Lord in that posture, smiling with eyes like the petals of lotuses grown in autumn, they were overwhelmed with happiness and immediately fell down like rods offering dandabats. Then they slowly rose and pleased the Lord by offering Him prayers. So they were praying initially to the Lord in the heart, now the Lord has appeared directly before them. So they, they definitely feel, oh, the Lord has come, our problems are over, He will do everything for us. Definitely the demigods will be thinking like that. They were thinking that, oh, we'll get him to kill the demon for us. He will do it. So they offer their prayers and uh, the demigods are very expert in glorifying the Lord. They offer feeling prayers. Here that this purport is very nice about text number 33. If you look at the purport there of text number 33, it describes, Prabhupada describes different ways how the devotees will realize the Lord. Different levels of devotees, transcendentalists, they will realize Him in different ways. And it's mentioned here, he can be realized first of all in his impersonal form, then he's the, the Brahman, the Supreme Brahman. And then he could also realized as Paramatma. And when he's realized as Paramatma, he's the Antaryami. But then he, he also expands himself in different forms for material creation. And we have the three Purusha avatars, Shiro Dakashai Vishnu, Garbo Dakashai Vishnu, Karana Dakashai Vishnu. The work of creation is done by these three forms of Lord Vishnu. So some people know him in these ways. In the uh, tenth canto Srimad Bhagavatam, the personified Vedas are offering prayers to Garbo Dakshai Vishnu. And we know at the 5,000 years ago, Lord Brahma was praying to Shirodakshai Vishnu in Svetadvip. And Lord Krishna, when, he, when it happened, there was an incident in Dwarka that uh, the Brahmana lost many of his children. And so Lord Krishna and Arjuna, they went to see Karanadakshai Vishnu. Karanadakshai Vishnu is Mahavishnu. And Mahavishnu is laying in the causal ocean in the abode of liberation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, just keep on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Very kind, thank you. So like this, three different forms of Vishnu, some people know like. And then there's also the Chaturvyuha. Vasudev, Sankarshan, Prajumnan, and Iruda. And that's entering more into the spiritual world, the Chaturvyuha, they're above the three forms of Vishnu. 
and Prabhupada describes it in, in the form of the chapter of Yuha, you have Vaikuntha Narayan. But you can go higher still. Some people are they're above Vaikuntha and they, they will come to Balarama, realization of Baladev. And then above Baladev there's also Krishna. So all of these different realizations are possible by devotional service. So we can know these different levels of realization. Prabhupada writes, the covered core of their heart is then com completely open to receiving an understanding of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in its various forms. All right. Then text 34 describes how the Lord, that he appears to be engaged in material activities but he's always transcendental. So his activities are very difficult to understand. And Prabhupada in the purport describes why it's so difficult to understand Lord Krishna. Because in one sense, it's that Lord Krishna is always situated in Goloka Vrindavan. He's always in his abode. Goloka eva nivasati akiladma bhuta. The Brahma Samhita, the Lord is always in Goloka Vrindavan. And then he never goes away from Vrindavan. There's another verse also describing how the Lord never takes one foot outside Vrindavan. But Krishna is situated, so he's in his own abode, but at the same time he's all pervading. He's everywhere. He's also, he's, he's therefore present everywhere. So it's very difficult. How do we understand Krishna? That he's present everywhere, at the same time he's in his abode? How to understand the Lord by these different ways, different things? At the end, Prabhupada said, according to Mayavadi philosophy, the Supreme Truth, being all-pervasive, does not need a transcendental form. That's a tendency which, you, you, when you cannot understand something, you come to Mayavadi philosophy. They will, they will say like that, oh, the Lord has no form. So the Mayavadis, they say that since his form is distributed everywhere, he has no form. But Prabhupada writes, this is not true. The Lord keeps his transcendental form, at the same time, he extends everywhere, in every nook and corner of the material creation. How to understand? It is inconceivable potency, achintya. We know from the invocation of Ishopanishad, Om Purnam Adapurnamidam, personality of Godhead is perfect and complete. Even though so many complete units emanate from him, still he remains a complete balance. So the Lord is everywhere, in everything, and at the same time he's in his abode. He has his own personal abode. So he's everywhere, in everything, in the form of Paramatma, by his uh, expansion. The Paramatma is pervading everything. So everything can be explained if we understand properly the principles of Krishna consciousness and we learn about the different potencies of the Lord. So they, they go, the demigods go on offering words of praise to the Lord.
Uh, okay, text number 39, there's another point be marked here. that uh, non-devotees, because of their meager knowledge and speculative habits, cannot understand the real nature of the Lord. A devotee who has once tasted the nectar from the Lord's lotus feet can realize what transcendental pleasure there is in the Lord's devotional service. A devotee knows that simply by rendering service to the Lord, he serves everyone. This is a, a point which is sometimes difficult for people to understand, how by serving Lord Krishna, how by serving the Supreme Lord, we're actually serving everyone. Would anyone like to comment on that? How would you explain that to people? that by serving the Supreme Lord, we're actually serving everyone. Uh, he is Maharaj within the Supreme Lord, everything is present. He is the source of everything, he is the Supreme Controller, the proprietor of everything. So, as per an analogy, if the water is poured into the root of the tree, the branches of the tree will be fully nourished. Similarly, if the Lord is served, then uh, everyone is served. Yes, that's a nice example. The Lord is Mula Prakriti, right? He's the roots of the material nature. And He's in everyone's heart. We satisfy Him, everyone will feel benefit. The whole world is benefited by Krishna consciousness movement. Okay, and then going ahead to 40, text number 40, talks about two kinds of devotees. You have the Sakama and the Niskama devotees, or Akama, Sakama and Akama. Sometimes we say Niskama. Sakama means devotees who have material desires. So the example, of course, here is the demigods. They have material desires. What is their desire? What desire do the demigods have? Metal enjoyment. Huh? Metal enjoyment. What, what particular enjoyment? What, in this particular instance, what is their desire? They've called the Lord, they've brought the Lord here, but they have their desire. What do they want to get from the Lord? They want uh, that the uh, Lord should feel Vritasura. All right, they want the Lord to take care of their problem. They have this demon, Vritasura, and they want the Lord to kill him. And so Prabhupada said, pure devotees are without, are, are akama, whereas devotees in the upper planetary system, such as the demigods, are called sakama because they still want to enjoy material opulences. That's the danger. You go to the higher planets, there's a lot of opulence. And we get attached to material opulence. We don't like to give it up. It's very difficult to go down the way. So the demigods are attached. Sakama devotees, meaning devotees with material desire, achieve from the Lord the results they desire from their prayers, but they do not immediately become fit to return back to Godhead. That's the problem. They're worshipping the Lord, but they're not going to go back to Godhead because they're asking the Lord to fulfill their material desires. They're praying to the Lord, but they're praying to the Lord for their material benefit. 
So they won't get back to Godhead in this lifetime. They'll have to take birth again. So we don't want to be in that category. We want to be pure devotees. So I was saying Rupa Goswami said, Anya Bilasita Sumyam. Going ahead, text 42, in the purport, the last section of the purport. Prabhupada writes, a pure devotee, however, knows that since the Lord is omnipresent and omniscient, there is no need to offer prayers or worship Him for one's personal benefit. You don't need to tell the Lord what you need. A pure devotee always engages in the service of the Lord without demanding anything. The Lord is present everywhere and follows the necessities of His devotees. Consequently, there is no need to disturb Him by asking Him for material benefits. We can give the example. Just like the woman may have a child, so the child may say, Mom, Mom, are you going to give me food today? Are you going to feed me? The mother will say, what do you mean? Of course I'll feed you. Every day I feed you. Why you ask like that? So the same way we're praying to the Lord. Oh Krishna, oh Narayan, do this for me. Oh Narayan, help me, help us. The Lord knows. The Lord takes care of His devotees. He knows everything. So the pure devotees, they won't ask anything from the Lord. They will only want to be engaged in the service of the Lord. And if anything happens, if he's in difficulties, then the pure devotee will think, this is my karma. This is the arrangement of the Lord. I should accept it, but I should go on with my service. Tate nukampam sushamek shamana punjana evatma kritam. Right? A devotee, one who tolerates all adverse conditions but goes on in my engaging in devotional service, then he's qualified to become my unalloyed devotee. So the pure devotees will tolerate all difficulties. They won't trouble the Lord. They won't be saying, Oh Krishna, oh you have to help me. <laughs> okay, text 43, beginning of the purport. One need only seek shelter of the shade of the Lord's lotus feet. Then all the material tribulations that disturb him will be subdued. Just as when one comes under the shadow of a tree, the disturbances caused by the heat of the scorching sun are immediately mitigated without one's asking for relief. Right? So the, the, what is the problem? We've forgotten Krishna. If we remember Krishna, there is no problem. The conditioned soul suffering from material tribulations because of existing in this material world can be relieved only when he seeks shelter at the Lord's lotus feet. When we take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, then there's no problem. Then we accept everything, whatever happens, as the mercy of the Lord, to go on with devotional service. So like that devotee has to think, we, the, the demigods in the higher planets, they are sakama devotees. They are devotees, but they have material desires. Therefore they are praying to the Lord, please help us, please save us from this danger, O oh Lord. Then text 45. The, demigod, the demigods certainly, the purport of text 45, the demigods certainly wanted Lord Vishnu to relieve their anxiety, but now they directly approached Lord Krishna. 
They were praying to Lord Narayan, the super soul, but now they're offering prayers to Lord Krishna. And they're asking Lord Krishna that, that you please help us. Mm -hmm. They want Lord Krishna to... Why did they suddenly change to Lord Krishna? What do you think? What's the reason? Huh? Krishna is complete full whole because that the Narayan is the expansion of Krishna. So he the uh, the topmost realization of the Lord with all appliances is complete whole. Yes, Krishna is the, the Supreme Lord, superior to even Narayan. And Krishna is also famous. His mission Paritranaya Sadhunam. Venus Chaya Chaduskritam. He's famous and he's a very expert in killing the demons and protecting his devotees. He likes to do that. It, it, it said in the, later on in the purport, now, Krishna is always famous for relieving his devotees from danger. So a devotee who sacrificed everything for the service of Krishna and whose only source of relief is the Lord is known as a kinchana. So Lord Krishna is being approached here, the demigods say, they, they, they feel that maybe Lord Narayan is not so much inclined to kill the demons, but Lord Krishna, he's very expert. He's got the Sudarshan Chakra and he's got his club. He can certainly kill this demon if he wants. So they're praying to Krishna to please help us in this way. So the Lord listened to the prayers and he was pleased and he replied to the Lord. He, he replies to the demigods. So it takes 47. Uh, text 47, the, the Lord is replying to the demigods and the Lord is pleased, he sees the, the knowledge that they're certainly devotees. In the purport, Prabhupada talks about how the impersonalists don't have proper knowledge, that their knowledge is incomplete. And he talks about when they pray to the Lord, they will address the Lord as being nameless. They always offer prayers indirectly. They will say, you are this, you are that, but they do not know to whom they are praying. A devotee, however, always offers personal prayers. A devotee says, Govinda Madhipursham Tamaham This is the way to offer prayers. If one continues to offer prayers to the Lord, personal prayers, then he is eligible to become a pure devotee and return home back to Godhead. Alright, so text 48, we hear the Lord is revealing a little bit, he's not so happy with the demigods because they have not asked for, they have not approached him for pure devotional service. And he, he says in text 48, 49 or 48, he said, I am pleased with a pure devotee whose mind is conclusively fixed on me, does not ask me for anything but the opportunity to engage in devotional service. And then in the purport Prabhupada says, the Lord wanted the demigods to pray for unalloyed devotional service, but instead they prayed for an opportunity to kill their enemy. This is the difference between a pure devotee and a devotee in the material platform. Indirectly, the Lord regretted 
that the demigods did not ask for pure devotional service. Then in the, in the next purport, in 49, Prabhupada explains, if one sincerely prays to God for material possessions in exchange for devotional service, the Lord, who is not foolish, like such an unintelligent devotee, he will show him special favour by taking away whatever material possessions he has and gradually giving him the intelligence to be satisfied only by rendering service to his lotus feet. So Krishna says, and Prabhupada also had that realisation and said, when Krishna, Krishna said, when I'm very merciful to someone, I take it away from them. So Prabhupada is making that point. Just like if the child is asking the mother, give me poison, give me poison. The mother is not going to give poison to the child. The same way the demigods are asking for material comforts, material benediction. The Lord is not very happy, he's not very pleased with this kind of prayer. Anyway, this is what happens, this is going on. So, it mentioned then, all of this, all these kind of benedictions, they're just due to lust. And these benedictions will be finished. Whatever you ask for, you want the benediction, you want money, you want the nice wife, you want the home, you want the good job, you want the career, it's all temporary, it's all going to be finished with the body. And so if you approach the Lord to get these kind of benedictions, then it's not going to help you to go back home, back to Godhead. We have to understand the temporary nature of the material world. And just to finish off here, a non-Vaishnava, one who is not engaged in the service of the Lord, is considered a fool with a small quantity of brain substance. So this is what the situation of the demigods. Anyway, the Lord, he understands their nature, they have a problem. And so you see text 51, he tells them what to do. You go to Dadichi and ask him for the bones, ask him to give his body without delay. Dadichi's done a lot of austerity and he's a, a great soul and if you go there and ask him for his bones, I think he'll give you them. And then you can use his bones and you can make a weapon. And they said because of this Narayana Kavacha, Dadichi's body is very strong. So you should beg him for his body. And with the bones from his body, then you can make a weapon which will kill this demon. It will certainly kill the demon. Huh? And when Vritasura is killed, because of my spiritual strength, you will again regain your strength, your weapons and your wealth. Vritasura can destroy all the three worlds. Do not fear that he will harm you. He is also a devotee and will never be envious of you. So the Lord gives a hint here in this final verse of this chapter that this demon Vritasura is actually a devotee. All right. So we have to stop here. Is there any questions anybody wants to ask? Uh, yes, Maharaj, I have a couple of questions. That is, uh, uh, Vasudev uh, is the son of Vasudev and Devaki uh, in Mathura, and Lord Krishna is uh, of Gola Vrindavan. So, in Brahma's prayer, it is stated that Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vigra Anadya Adigovinam Sarva Karanam Karanam. Means Krishna is the cause of all causes. Also, here, uh, what we studied now, Vasudeva is also called cause of all causes. Which one appears to be appropriate uh, 
Well, Vasudeva is Lord Krishna, is another name for the super soul, right? Vasudeva Sarvamiti Samahatma Sudurlaha. There's Vasudeva and Vasudeva, right? Vasudeva, the son of the son of Vasudeva, Lord Krishna. Uh, so Maharaj, both the understandings are correct. Cause of all causes, Krishna, Vasudeva. So why sometimes Vasudeva is called also the impersonal conception? Hmm? Sometimes Vasudeva is called uh, is called in uh, Bhagavatam impersonal in, impersonal conception of the Lord. Sarva uh, Vapak, it pervades everywhere. Why it is so? Well, because it, as a super soul, is all pervading. So, Maharaj, he can't be cause of all causes. Krishna can be cause of all causes. Yes. He's the expansion of Krishna. But it is differently stated that Vasudeva is the cause of all causes, Krishna is the cause of all causes. No. Well, there's no real difference. Just like Vishnu and Krishna, there's no real difference. So Vasudev and Krishna, there's no real difference. Okay, Maharaj. So, Anuk says, um, uh, what is the what is the purpose uh, meaning of uh, Chaturbhuj expansion? Because Lord expands first expansions Balaram, then expands Narayan into Vaikuntha planet, then for creation of this world Vishnu incarnations, Karvado, Kirado, Kanda, um, uh, yeah, Kirado, Vishnu, Mahavishnu, Karvado, and Kirado, Vishnu. But what is the meaning exactly? What is the meaning of Chaturbhuj expansion? Vasudeva Sankarsan or Pradyumna Anurut? Well, there are four expansions which exist in the spiritual world and they do different functions. Just like uh, one is in charge of false ego, one is in charge of the mind, one is in charge of... Uh, it's all mentioned in Kapila Shiksha. You must have studied it when you study Kapila Shiksha in the third canto. The different Vasudev, Sankarsana, Aniruddha and Prajumna. They're in charge of different uh, elements of the material nature. I'd have to refer to the Kapila Shiksha again to see exactly what they're all doing. But they have functions. They're all expansions of Lord Krishna in the Vaikuntha. Maharaj, Krishna expanded uh, as Narayana into Vakunta planet. Was it necessary to expand in these four? In this quadruple expansion again? Yeah, because they all do different functions. Yes, ma'am. One's in charge of the mind, one's in charge of intelligence, one is in, you know, Sankar, you've got Sankar, Sankarshan's in charge of false ego. Yes, ma'am, well, the last question is that, uh, yes, um, um, the sin, the uh, Indra could distribute the sins uh, over earth, trees, women. So anyone uh, who on sins can distribute others, like devotees. Hmm? Well, I, I'm not following you. What are you talking about? Say again. Indra, Indra distributed all his sins over trees, uh, earth, and uh, women. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, yeah. Similarly, a devotee, what sin he on can distribute others. A devotee can distribute sins to others? Yeah. No. Devotee doesn't do that. A devotee will suffer the sins himself. A devotee thinks, I am sinful and fallen, I should suffer. A devotee, we will, we will take the sins. Vasudev Datta, great devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he played to Lord Chaitanya. Let me take the sins of all the people. I will stay here and suffer. That is the devotee. That is pure devotee. Lord Chaitanya was so pleased. We are full of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. We don't give sins to others. We will take sins from others.
Okay, any other questions? Getting a bit late. Okay, anyway, thank you very much. So we'll meet next week and we'll continue. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we can see them next week when we come, next Saturday. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki.